Well, if you were with us in the first assembly, I hope you're going to check your feet this week. Check your feet and make sure that you are finishing stronger than when you first began this race. But now we're going to turn our attention to real change once again. You know, as we think about this topic and as I I began to think more uh, about this study as much as I'm enjoying it, if we're going to see real change, we've got to get real about change. We've got to get real about change if we're going to see real change. Otherwise, we're going to be just like those Israelites who walked in those days of old and they came and they listened to the preaching and the teaching of the prophet Ezekiel, but they would not do. They were sitting, they were listening, they were hearing to what he was preaching, but they would not prepare themselves for the destruction that was going to come. And so the scriptures tell us that Ezekiel's voice was like a lovely song that could be played on an instrument. Brethren, the gospel is not a lovely song that is just played on an instrument. The gospel says that destruction is coming. You've got to be preparing. Are you preparing for the destruction? The gospel is a message of action. It's a message of warning. It is a message of change. And so we think about these things and we realize that we need to get real about change if we're going to see change in the first place. The gospel demands it. You know, when you look in the the early record of the church, you can find that oftentimes it is change that is needed in the church herself. Sometimes the greatest need for change is in the body of Christ. Even in that early record, the sacred record that we read here in the scriptures, we can find that even in the early days there in the book of Acts, that there was a complaint that arose in the church, gongismos, like a gong, playing over and over and over and over again. And it became so loud that it rose up and even it came to the ears of the twelve apostles. It came to their ears, these ones who had been appointed, who had been chosen, who had been given to the work and the task of bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were to go out into the, all the world, the entire world, and bear witness to this resurrection. And here was this complaint rising up to their ears. And it wasn't, of course, the only, the, the only congregation there that we read about, the church in Jerusalem. We look in the church in Antioch there, and there too they would be uh, suffering in part from internal conflict. We learn about those ones who would come down from that Judean country, from Jerusalem. they come down uh, to Antioch there, and they would begin to teach falsely. They would teach falsely. And so... Internal conflict, problems happening in the church, change was needed. So, sometimes the greatest need for change is in the church. But as many, as often as we see the problems around us, and sometimes the problems in the church, we can be assured of this. We can be assured of this, that God's word offers a solution. We can overcome the problems that we have in the church. We can overcome and disciples can be multiplied once again in our country land. Right here in our own land, we can see those disciples multiplying greatly. Just as the church did when they overcame these internal conflicts and affairs that were happening. But we've got to get real about change. We're going to see real change. This is a one point sermon today. How can we see real change in the church? This is going to be a short and sweet, uh, a one-point sermon. And maybe I shouldn't have said that because now I've got to make good on that promise. <laughs> but this is a one-point sermon. How can we see real change in the church? And here's the answer. We've got to pilot our own plane. We've got to pilot our own plane if we're going to see real change in the church. You know, if we could compare change to a flight that needs to get from point A to point B, the emphasis in getting from point A to point B on that flight, if you're a pilot, is you've got to make sure that you are piloting that plane that's been given to you, and you've got to make sure that you're staying within your lane if you're going to get from point A to point B. And that's exactly how we're going to see change in the church today for the better. We're going to see the kind of change that God wants us to see today. We've got to pilot our own planes and we've got to stay in our lane and stay there and remain doing our work. 
Again, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn over there. You know, we, we see this. We see how this was done in these two examples that I've given you already. The church there in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch. And that's exactly what they did. When this gongismos came up, this, this gong like hitting it over and over again, this loud noise that was coming up to the apostles there. When that happened, when that complaint arose, and, and it came to the ears of the twelve, you know what they did? Think about this also. When the church in Antioch, when those false teachers came down there to the church and they began to teach falsely, you know what they did? They both did the same thing. Members kept to their place. Members kept to their place. And because they kept to their place, we saw real change happening in this church. And we saw a prosperity. We saw a, a growth happening here. Again, we come back to Acts chapter 6 to this example here with the church in Jerusalem where they hear this complaint rising up. The Hellenists are making a complaint against the Hebrews. And so here's this complaint. They're hearing about these things happening. What do they do? The twelve summon the multitudes. They summon that church together. And here's exactly what they say verbatim. It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Leave. Kata la po. Kata to cut down. They po to leave. They said it was not desirable that they should leave behind the word of God. To set it down and leave it behind and go and serve tables. That's exactly what these twelve had said to the church. You know, Peter also said something similar about how false teachers, how they had katalepo, they had set down and left behind the right way. They set down and left behind the right way to go where? To go to the wrong way. And that's sometimes what happens in the church. Something's happening and we leave something behind that we ought to be doing. We leave something the, the right way that we should be following and we go the wrong way. The apostle said it is not desirable that we should set down and leave behind this right way and start going the wrong way. That's exactly what they taught. We're not going to go the wrong way. Well, what's the problem here, apostles? Are you just too good to serve tables? You're just too good to serve, serve tables? You're not, you're, you're not uh, uh, lowly enough to serve those tables? Well, if that were the case, why would these apostles appoint seven men full of the Holy Spirit of good reputation to see over the business of this work? No, it was very important. It was very important that the needs of the church here be met and satisfying those needs and those complaints that were coming against uh, the Hebrews there concerning their widows. This was a very important work. You know, in the church today, we have a lot of things going on and they're all important. But it was not about the importance or the value of those works. It was about the place, the place of the apostles and what role they had to play in those works. You ever hear that phrase? Know your role. You, and I don't really like that term, terminology because it kind of sounds demeaning sometimes, but that's exactly what we're talking about here. The church members here, they knew their role. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do, and as they continued to do those things, there was prosperity in the church. Again, consider your thoughts with me in the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 15. The exact same thing happens here. We see these false teachers. They come down to Antioch and they begin to teach falsely. Falsely. Is that a big deal? Is that a big deal that, the, that, that these men are teaching false doctrine? Is that something that we ought to just ignore and, and imagine that's not really there? Absolutely not. It was a big, big deal. But you know what happened? You know when, when uh, Luke here describes us and tells us that there was no small dissension? No small dissension about, between these men and some other men, and who were those men? Those men were none other than teachers of the gospel. When there was false doctrine, false gospel being taught there, guess who addressed that need? Those who were teachers of the gospel. Those are the ones who addressed that need. And then when things still could not be settled, here's what they did. They sent them there to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Well, well why would they do that? Because elders, leaders, are apt to teach. They're apt to teach. And so there they would go and they would confer this matter with those who were teachers of the gospel, those who were apt to teach. Again, we want to emphasize here, we want to make this a major point of emphasis, that it's not about the importance or the value 
of the other members' works. It wasn't because those members there in the church in Antioch, well, they were just too lowly to take up the word of God and address false teaching. That's not what happened at all. Not what happened at all. Just like the church there in Jerusalem, those apostles were not uh, too high to, to come down and, and serve tables. Not at all. In fact, they showed the, how important those things were. And the church in Antioch, those things were extremely important. But it just wasn't the place of some. And so, what do we learn from these accounts? We learn that we need to keep our place. And here's the point. The talk is in the money. The talk is in the money. Well, Dan, I think the solution to all the problems in the church, and we can think of all these different ideas and these problems to solve the church, but the talk is in the money. Here's what the Scriptures teach us. Here's what the Bible tells us. And that's what's important. Because the Bible shows us exactly how we ought to solve these problems and what will lead to prosperity. Acts chapter 6 again, here's what the Bible says. When this course of action was followed, where every member was knowing their role, their place, and they were carrying this out, they're carrying out their function to the fullest degree, the Bible tells us this, the word of God spread. Acts chapter 6 verse 7. The word of God spread. Same word as that is used to describe Jesus growing in the spirit. As he grew strong in the spirit, yes, also the word of God spread. The word of God was spreading just like a young man who hits puberty. You look at him and you say, whoa, look at him. He just grew up. How'd that happen? That's what the word of God did. The word of God spread. It grew up. There it was. The people were saying, whoa, what happened here? I can't believe what just happened here. Look at how it grew up. Couldn't believe your eyes, but there it was. The word of God spread. It says that the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. They multiplied. There was two, there was four, there was six, ten, twenty, a hundred, two hundred, four hundred, eight hundred. Look at how they're multiplying. This is amazing what's happening when members are keeping their place in the church and doing their part to the fullest degree and function. And look at this. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. A great many. That preacher down there, you mean that preacher, that, that one, that priest of that parish down there, you mean he became a Christian? That's right. He became a Christian because every member in the church was doing their part to the fullest degree, laboring within their sphere, doing their part. And that, then we see those priests growing in abundance, obeying the faith. Even in Acts chapter 15, the church in Antioch there, again, the same thing is happening here. When they, each member is keeping their place and, and doing what they ought to do, we see how there was, this, uh, there was this accomplishment, there was this success in this meeting. They, they resolved all the things that had happened there. And what happened? They took this message and they began to encourage. The members began to be strengthened. They began to be encouraged. They began to be strengthened. And not only that, this report of what had happened here actually began to go out into other parts of the country. And there in Acts chapter 16, here's what it tells us. The churches were strengthened in the faith. And they increased in number daily. Every day, look at that. They're growing. They're strengthening. They're growing and they're strengthening in number. We see, again, the results of each member keeping their place. Knowing their role. Working within their sphere of labor. It is of utmost importance that if we are going to see real change in the church, that each of us labor within our sphere that has been given to us. You know, here's a scripture from Corinth that Paul wrote to the church there. He reminded us that God has set each member, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Here it is again. God has set each member in the body just as he pleased. Here it is again, one more time. God has set each member in the body just as He's pleased. God has a place for each of us. And each of us need to labor and endeavor to work in that place. What happens if the eye begins to say, I want to be the hand? Well, where's the eye? What happens if the, the, the foot begins to say, I want to be the, the, the hand? Again, where's the, where's the foot? We can go on and on through all these examples, can't we? Can't we? But we see how the body, the human body, illustrates perfectly for us the importance of how that body can function, how it can go to that optimal efficiency in working and laboring to bring fruit for the Lord. Every member of that human body has to remain in its place and it has to continue to do its part. 
And that's how that human body can function and prosper. And that, friends, is how the, Christ, the body of Christ can function and how it can prosper. You know, if we were to bring this down to a modern day example, perhaps, maybe we could even illustrate it this way. You know, Mr. and, and Mrs. Uh, Doe, with a family of eight, come into the congregation. And as they come into the congregation, they are assigned the task of looking over the church mail, what comes in and what goes out. And so as they continue to labor through this work over the years, they become increasingly discontent with what is going on in the Bible school program. What's, what's going on in the building uh, maintenance and operation? What, what's going on in the, uh, in the preaching and the teaching? What's going on in the, the leadership? What, what's going on in the deacons? What's going on in all the works of the members? You see where I'm getting at here? There's a lot of works going on in the church. And pretty soon, Mr. and Mrs. Doe say, well, I, I think we ought, I ought to have some of my business over here, and I need to have some of my business over here. And guess what happens when they take their hands off of their work? Nobody's doing the work over here. And guess what's happening? Mr. and Mrs. Smith of 10 are becoming increasingly discontent with what's going on in the church mail. And they're becoming discontent with what's going on in the Bible school program and, and, and the preaching and the teaching and the eldership. You see how this all works out? When every member doesn't maintain and work to labor in their sphere, it all becomes messy. The human body doesn't function right, and neither does the church of our Lord. Each of us must labor to work and to pilot our own plane to the best of our ability. When Paul wrote to Timothy there, he reminded him that he was to be an example to the believers in love and conduct and spirit and faith and all of these things. And he told him to give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And he was not to neglect the gift that was in him. Don't neglect that, Timothy. Don't get wrapped up in all these things that are going on. You've got your gift. You do not neglect that. You continue in them. For in doing these things, you will save both yourself and yourself. And uh, those who hear you, give yourself entirely, he said. Give yourself entirely to them. Don't neglect that gift. Give yourself entirely to them. Meditate on these things. So, brethren, as we labor throughout this week, help God help us and let us pray and maintain to keep that spirit of diligence to work within our own sphere, to be an example to the believers around us in the work that we are doing. So that we can say just the same as with the Apostle Paul, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where uh, another man has labored, that, that I may not build on another man's foundation. Paul made it his aim to preach the gospel where no other man was working. And that's where we need to maintain our labor and our vision and our focus. Working in those things that we can work within our sphere of labor, working in those things that God has talented us to do, and we can be a blessing to his church and begin to see real, real change. Real change will be just beyond the horizon if we will maintain our work, our vision, to do the work of the Lord. Is there anyone here this morning that has not become a member of the body of Christ? You know, in order to get into the body of Christ, you need to be baptized into Christ. The scriptures tell us plainly we must be baptized into Christ in order to get into him and to be a member of his saving church. If we can help you in any way this morning to do that, why don't you come now and stand and sing.